My name is Tanner Seeley, and I'm here with my partners, Claire Beckwith and John Angelo. And today we're going to be talking to all of you guys a little bit about swaps. And I'm sure you all know, and maybe the only thing you do know about swaps, is that they're the slowest animal on that. And that's true. Um, but there are also many different types of sloths in primate insects. But today, I'm going to be talking to you about the Bradfuss pygmus, uh, which is just a pygmy three-toed sloth. Um, one of its main distinctions is that it has three toes. So, this sloth um, is, again, one of six species, and it lives on as the last one of the bear glass, which is just off the coast of Panama. Um, it's one of the only species um, of sloths that is labeled as critically endangered. And that's because in the last eight or so years, its population has almost been cut in half. Um, the sloth weighs about 5.5 to 7.7 pounds. And it's Ranges from 19 to 21 inches, and it is the smallest sloth to exist. So, the sloth faces a lot of danger, of course, it's been critically endangered. And just to touch on it real quick, it's human interaction and habitat exploitation that is really causing the sloth to go endangered. And this will all be touched on later, I'm just going to briefly introduce it. And these sloths grow in the mangrove forest of Panama, uh, which is not very big. There's 26 acres of land that these sloths grow on, and they live on 4.3 square kilometer island, and that is very small for an island. To give you a sense, Hadley's about 63 square kilometers, so these sloths are living on 1 14th the size of Hadley. Nevertheless, only 26 acres. And these sloths are really confined. You know, they don't have many places to go, not many forests to live in there, but they really do love it there. It's, it's made for them. Um, when you first look at this beautiful island, you think the forest getaway, you know, Caribbean, it's a great place to go, but not many people go there. And, and we like that. We don't want many people to go there. And right now it's flourishing. The waters are still crystal blue. And the island itself is part of Bocas del Toro which is a province located in the Mosquito Gulf. Um, there are many islands in this chain, the Bocos Calcora, and they all are very similar with the water and the uh, size. However, this is the smallest island out of all five of so. For a majority of the size of distance, those are not It's only been around for 9,000 years. And the sloths have lived there for all 9,000 years. However, only recently have humans been involved in this island. So the sloths live in 10 main areas on this island. They're going to be the red areas on this map. These are called thickets. They're the mangrove forest areas. And all 40 remaining sloths live between the 10 areas. Now, there's also coral, the yellow is going to be the coral, so that is the sea. And these sloths actually like to live near the sea because they're actually really good swimmers. And their ability to swim is what is keeping the 40 alive since they live in the trees most of the time. But every two weeks they do have to go to the ground to proceed to go to the bathroom where their population is Rarely cut off by feral cats. Now, another top of the guy shows all the vegetation in some several thickets. And more natural reasons, as I kind of already mentioned, that the fossil sort of things are feral cats and their ability to run away from these cats. However, these fossils do have some adaptation, very little though. They have camouflage and a very neutral and natural smell for them. There is a specific algae called the Trichellus algae, and this allows the sloth to really blend in with its environment. And this is another reason 
that this law, the three code kidneys law, can only live on this island because of the symbiotic relationship. However, the symbiotic relationship will not be able to keep the species alive for much longer if we don't continue to put in our own pelvis humans. And in return to this declining population of sloth due to bureaucrats in our own uh, on the island, scientists and many conservationists have stepped in. Um, different groups, which will also be um, mentioned later and more explained, such as the EDGE group, have already been developing solutions and monitoring the island a little bit. So, different researchers have made their way into the island. However, most of the island, about 85%, is still unexplored. And they've been having sloths putting some GPSs on them to monitor them in these different thickets to make sure that the population doesn't go down anymore. And another big part is the locals. And the locals, which will again be touched on later, have made control over this island. And the different conservation groups, such as EDGE, have been able to get these locals involved with the island and the sustainability. And so far, in 2021, about 160 locals, which doesn't sound like a lot, but again, it's a small island, and you know, not small, have been involved in sustainability for the environment projects, hosted by EDGE which is a big step forward in the right direction to helping these lots grow again. And the mangrove trees that the sloth live in are what us humans are after. And these sloths love these trees. It's the only place these sloths can live in. And they only eat the mangrove leaves. This is their main diet. And we're just taking it right away from them. We're just taking their shelter and their food. And there's no reason for that. These sloths are one of the most harmless and innocent animals to exist. Again, they provide symbiotic relationships and they take nothing away from us. While living on uninhabited land, you would think that they'd be completely safe. However, different forests and fishermen, merchants have gone to this island and taken the mangrove trees from it for the timber. Again, there's only 26 acres of this timber available on the island, and eventually we will run out. <coughs> now, these sloths, um, there's only 48 of them, and they will not survive more than eight years if we continue taking the land of trees from the forest. <coughs> now, is it worth making these sloths live their final days? as they watch forests come onto the island and take away the property? Is it worth building things, such as casinos and hotels on the small island, and letting the graves of 50 or so sloths sit there for eternity? Is it really worth having these sloths sit there and suffer and fall out of the trees? As sad it is, when we're taking their trees and their home away from them, just for our benefit on the small island? It's not. And this is why we need to step in. We need to put our foot down, and we're not going to watch another species go extinct. Because 160 species of plants and animals have already gone extinct this year from humans as well. And to really study these sloths a little more, to get a little more involved in their relationship with their habitat and their um, relatives and sloths, we're going to have to dive in a little bit more. So. A bit of history on the cell. So, over the last 9,000 years, obviously they've been secluded to this island. And a study was conducted not too long ago by a man named Robert Anderson. And he found that of the Bradypus uh, genus on five different islands in these regions, all of them were smaller than their mainland counterparts. Now, these adaptations or something that is related to a principle called Foster's Rule, or the Island Rule, which is meant to symbolize if there are no known predators of a species, it will get larger, and if it has a lack of resources, it will get smaller. And these principles are referred to as insular gigantism and insular dwarfism. 
And the pygmy sloth is affected by insular dwarfism, however, it is very crucial for it as it has nowhere to go other than those 26 acres. And to compare the pygmy sloth to one of its mainland counterparts, the brown-throated three-toed sloth, which is the closest relative of the pygmy sloth, is 40% heavier in body mass and 15% larger in length, which is significant amount from the almost seven pounds that a pygmy sloth can reach. And uh, I think at max 20 inches of pygmy sloth can reach. And another issue with being stuck on an island is genetic diversity. And although genetic diversity has a lot of problems, these sloths have been able to adapt to it over these 9,000 years. And through the constant in inbreeding, they have eliminated all the previous deadly recessive alleles that could have wiped them out. However, due to all of this, they're stuck with almost the exact same alleles from every single sloth, all 50 of them, meaning that new diseases and climate change they're unable to adapt to, which means that it could kill them off just like that. And so, and so as we see, it was recorded in 2012 that there were about 70 of them. Eight years later, we're sitting here and there are 50. And it's still decreasing, and if something's not done, they're going to be extinct before we know. So if we know so much about these sloths, and we know the things that happen to them, why can't we stop it? And why can't we help them get a natural flourishing habitat? Well, because we're the problem. These mangrove trees on the island are being cut down by the people who are local. And although they are using it to sustain their own temporary homes, because they do not inhabit the island year round, they do use it and they go out and they cut down the largest tree they can find in these thickets and they create their homes, leaving less room for the soft pillow. And then there is tourists. So tourism is a very large issue on this island because especially with human interaction, sloths aren't very good with being interrupted from their things. And one of the largest problems with tourism is that there's not an enforcement of the protection that this island should have or the protection that the island does have. And then there's trapping. And trapping is harmful to many species, almost all of them. And especially with sloths. Sloths can be treated as if they were porcelain. They are extremely fragile and they get stressed extremely easily. Any amount of stress can cause damage to their respiratory and their digestive system, which leads to 80 to 90% of all sloths that are trafficked dying. If all of these sloths were to be trafficked, there would be no more than five at best. The sloth that I have in my hand is purple, it smells nice, and it has cute eyes. This sloth right here sells to humans. Contrast it with an actual sloth that's maybe not so nice smelling. It has algae growing in its hair, and it farts out of the nose. Yes. That sloth is highly less marketable than a sloth that right here, as I described, is purple and has nice eyes. Marketers did this because they wanted to sell the sloths, but by doing so, 
This informed many people, and the sloths are facing the effects to this day. The fascination and desire uh, to see the sloth is because marketers made them so appealing. And this is the reason why the pygmy three-toed sloth is having its environment being overrun. Marketing, however, can be good if used correctly. With many interested in sloths because of marketing, awareness movements could be very, very effective. And these sloths could be supported by bad solutions. This could also stop people from visiting the island, and human interactions could be limited, which would benefit the sloths greatly, as humans are what are killing these sloths. And there's some more uh, influenced sloths that are causing this fascination with the sloths. And <laughs> So, with all of the attention being drawn to these sloths, although there are many positive attention through all the organizations such as EDGE, which will be touched upon more later, there's also negative attention. Tourism is still a problem, no matter how little it may be. And these sloths do not need that, as they could be destroyed by us just within moments. And so why should you care? Well, although it may be just a sloth on some random island in the middle of the Caribbean, it's more than just that. Because if we don't care about this, why should we care about the polar bears? A sloth and a polar bear are facing the same problems. Their environment is being destroyed around them, their habitat reduced to nothing by our actions. And if we do not do something to help them, they will die. And so, if we don't care about one, why should we care about the other? If we care about none of it, we lose it all. And then what do we have left? It is clear that research for saving the pygmy three-toed sloth is behind in comparison to how critical this sloth endangerment is. With estimates that there are just roughly 50 sloths left, it is extremely concerning that researchers don't even have precise numbers. Although research is behind, there is one project that is making the biggest difference by far, and this is the EDGE project, as it continues to work towards understanding the sloths better day in and day out. Although they are fighting a losing battle with minimal research, they are working the hardest to produce new information that will deter people from Escudo de Veraguas. If we listen to specialists like the Endangered Species Coalition, by picking one project already underway to support, and we pick EDGE to be that project, we can truly give the sloths an EDGE in their fight for survival. Volunteering for a project like EDGE is also a perfect way to get to see sloths. And you can support organizations like EDGE by and um, make physical differences, and you can see them. And donating to projects like this is also another very simple but effective way of making a great difference. Even with lacking research, it is very evident that even though EDGE is working as hard as they can, they simply, simply cannot save the sloth species on their own. With numbers constantly dropping and new numbers reaching below 50, it is clear that the time to act is now. But how are people like us going to make a difference when the EDGE team works with these animals physically every day and they still can't stop their decline? To answer this, we must understand that the EDGE team cannot change laws on their own, and they cannot create mass amounts of awareness on their own as well. And if they cannot create mass amounts of awareness, how are the locals going to know that they, their, their visits on this island are creating drastic effects on the sloth? Supporting movements like these are huge steps that everyday people like us can do to save the sloths that the EDGE team can't do on their own. People can also adopt a sloth, where you adopt a sloth that represents a sloth in the community. And you get a stuffed animal, and the money that you spend buying the stuffed animal 
is going to projects like Edge or other projects that are helping this law survive. Some of these laws can be Pocahontas here that you can support. And another way to support could be signing petitions that could create stricter traveling laws or create higher fines for um, trespassing. And if done successfully, this support can give the Pygmy Sloths enough freedom from humans to prosper in the lands they are adapted for and begin to thrive once again on the lands that should be humanless. I completely understand this harmless animal always has a cute grin on its face. It can swim and is truly adorable and hard to resist seeing yourself. And with marketers portraying them as cuter than they actually are, I cannot fault anyone for falling victim into wanting to see this mammal. However, saving the sloth cannot be a project that only the Edge team fights for. It is up to us as humans to prevent the sloth from deforestation by raising awareness. It is up to us as humans to volunteer time into saving the animals we harmed when we fell victim to their adorable marketing. And it is up to us as humans to make a change and to stop the tragedies that take place on Escudo de Veraguas because it was us humans who caused this tragedy in the first place. Thank you.